I have awards. Is that what they're doing now? Is this something old? It's going to be two minutes. No, they're doing awards. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Good evening. And welcome to this opening panel. Uh, those of you who attended Melissa Lerwani Larson's presidential address uh, heard that this year we're trying to focus in part on Eugene England. Uh, he attended the organizing meeting of the Association for Mormon Letters back in 1976, and of course was a, was a major figure in many areas of Mormon literature as a, a writer, as a critic, as a publisher, um, and, and as a proponent of the field. And so tonight we'll be reflecting on uh, Dean's writing and contributions and, and legacy. Um, tomorrow night we'll be unveiling a work of a hundred significant works of Mormon literature, um, trying to carry on that, that conversation about what's significant in the field. And then, um, Following that, we'll have other presentations to explore what's happened in, in Mormon literature since and where the field is today. Uh, so joining us on our main panel tonight are Robert A. Reese. Uh, and I'll give just brief introductions to everyone and their connection to Dean England. Of course, they have many accomplishments, but Robert uh, edited the 2005 collection, Proving Contraries, a collection of, writing, of writings in honor of Eugene England. And, as a friend and associate of Eugene's. Uh, he'll talk tonight about Eugene England and his influence on poetry and his own poetry. Uh, he'll be followed by Karen Rosenbaum, who wrote some of the first short stories Eugene England published in Dialogue and had worked in his anthology, Bright Angels and Familiars. She also contributed an essay to Proving Contraries. Uh, third, we'll hear from Christine Hogland, who wrote the recent volume, Eugene England, A Mormon Liberal, uh, for the Introductions to Mormon Thought series at the University of Illinois Press. She'll be talking about uh, Gene England as essayist. And then finally, we'll hear from Calvin Burke, who got to know Eugene England through his correspondence and writings as a research assistant for Terrell Givens' Stretching the Heavens, The Life of Eugene England and the Crisis of Modern Mormonism. And he'll be talking some about Eugene England's letters and other personal writings. Um, so we'll go ahead and hear for 10 minutes each from each of those panelists. And then we have some other guests who can respond. If you have any questions or comments throughout, go ahead and use the, the video chat and we'll be able to share those with our panelists at the conclusion of their remarks. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Well, Thank you, James. It's a privilege to be able to talk about Jane England as poet. Uh, I've been privileged the last uh, few months to have uh, possession of the dozen or so poems that Gene wrote. It surprised me uh, actually that he had written so few, but um, as I've been uh, reading the, the early poems, the things, the, poem, the love poems he wrote to Charlotte, uh, poems on other occasions, I, I remember someone saying that uh, a great poet is, some, is somebody who's written a great poem. Uh, Greatness, of course, is something that uh, uh, sometimes requires the test of time, but I'm convinced that uh, some of Gene's poetry will uh, uh, have endured and will continue to endure. It is in some ways a, a shame that Gene was so active in so many other things because I think that he could have written uh, more poems, but who would want to uh, uh, him not to have done all of the other things that, uh, that he did? He certainly had a poet's heart and a poet's spirit and his love of words as we see in his essays and so many other ways in which he expressed himself clearly uh, indicates uh, someone who has a poetic voice and a poetic vision. I think uh, primarily of two poems, Kinsman, a uh, poem he wrote in a sense that is about uh, uh, his father's dedication of him to the ministry of Christ as they were out in the, the wheat field uh, and his father knelt down grabbing the, the, the kernels of wheat. I'll just read the last couple of stanzas. Plucking random heads, we counted and chewed the milky kernels 
and then he knelt and grasped the wheat. Sorry, Bob, I accidentally muted you while taking care of another sound issue. Could you unmute yourself and start the poem reading over again? Okay, okay. There, this isn't the first time somebody's tried to mute me, James, so we'll carry on here. Anyway, this poem called Kinsman, which Gene wrote about the time that he and his father were in the wheat fields in Idaho. His father was a wheat farmer and they went out to a look at the crop and as his father grasped the kernels of wheat, he prayed uh, with his hand on Jean to God, thou art the prince who holds my heart and gives my body power to make the fruit as thine. This wheat, this boy, protect the yield that we may live. And Jean says, and fear thrilled me on that hushed ground so that I grew beyond the wheat and watch my father take his hold on what endures beyond the veil. Uh, so much of Gene's life began in that wheat field and so much of uh, the unfolding of his uh, words with language, I think, come from that prayer and that poem. Uh, in May of 1999, I uh, read the morning New York Times, read an article about a woman, Maria Toledo, who was a uh, refugee from Ecuador living in Boston and fleeing somehow homeless. We don't know exactly what. She was leading her four young sons uh, across a, uh, a train track when one of the boys raced ahead just as the train was coming. She grabbed the boys, raced to save him. The train hit and killed all of them. It was one of those horrible stories that we read about. Uh, it was the kind of story that Jean and I often talked about, and we talked about uh, suffering and the paradox of life and uh, of time and eternity. So I sent the story to Jean, and uh, we talked about it. We were uh, we found out later that this uh, it, the New York Times article didn't say that she was Mormon, but we found out later that she was. And Jean wrote a poem based on that called Two Trains and a Dream. And in that, one of the epigraphs for that poem was uh, from, uh, from Virgil. Et in Arcadia ego, that is death is saying, I am also in Arcadia. And Jean writes, there are three stanzas. The first is about uh, Joseph Smith, uh, the, uh, 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 Joseph Smith, the son of Hiram Smith, Joseph F. Smith who was coming home from Boston on a train heading towards Salt Lake City. And as he's in this train heading across Wyoming, he goes and stands at the end of the train, the very end, and he's looking out over watching the, uh, the antelope and watching the fields. And he hears this voice, go back and sit down. He didn't respond to it at first, and then it came more strongly, go sit down. He went back in the train and sat in his seat. And shortly thereafter, the train went off its rails and uh, all, all of the, 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 uh, uh, the, the ca uh, cabinets of the train rolled and across, but except the one that he was in and his life was saved. So he writes that poem about a prophet who is saved by hearing a voice. And then he writes the story of Julia Toledo, his second stanza, uh, Boston, leaving Providence, Rhode Island, struck a train from Boston struck Julia Toledo from a Mormon family in Ecuador and her four sons walking on the tracks. All were killed instantly except Jose 10, who died two days later. Then the third stanza, which is the, uh, uh, the really important one, uh, is about the dream. These are two trains and this is the dream. And this is the stanza. In my dream, God is listening carefully as I tell him the stories and ask him, which of these trains, which children was it, were in your hand? We are both seated quite comfortably on a green satin French provin provincial couch in a room painted by Watteau. 
God asks me if I am proud or rebellious. I notice that he is luminous under his robe. And his face is serene beyond all description. His skin young, downy, but full of pores. I can see small white scars across his forehead. Then tears gather in his eyes, and slowly tears begin to drop like blood from every pore. I ask again, which train is on your hands? He sets his face toward me. Like flint, he says, both, all. That poem captures, I think, both Jean's poetic sense of the tragedy of life, but also his sense of trying to make some harmony out of things that don't are not harmonious, some way to see how a prophet hears a voice and this young woman, this young mother with her sons crossing a train track does not. And the question that arises, which is in your hands? When I read that poem again today, I felt that uh, that sense that I have in, in the presence of great poetry and that Emily Dickinson says when, when she reads such a poem, she feels a cold uh, on her body that no uh, fire can warm. That power of poetry to touch us deeply in our hearts and our souls and our spirits, I think is what Jean England's life was about. It was a privilege to, uh, to know him. It was a privilege to talk with him about his poems and about mine as we exchanged letters and had conversations about this paradox of life. And in the book that I put together in his honor called Proving Contraries, the last chapter was Jean England Enters Heaven. And I set, talked about how I imagined Jean entering heaven and the things that happened. And among those was his writing poetry. And I look forward in the next life to reading more of Jean's poems. Thank you. Bob, can we hear next from Karen? Gene England was an exemplary essayist. He was a gifted poet. He did not write, as far as I know, fiction, but he was a champion of Mormon literature of all genres, including novels and short stories. In the introduction of Bright Angels and Familiars, his 1992, anthology of what he called contemporary Mormon stories. He describes home literature as sentimental and moralistic. Church magazines, it may surprise some of you to learn, used to publish short stories. As a child, I remember reading in my Mother's Relief Society magazine a story with line drawings about a young woman with a dilemma. Which of two brothers should she marry? In my memory, the older brother was serious, hardworking, devout, and wore a tie. The younger was playful, gentle, inquisitive, and wore a sports shirt. You can guess which one she chose. A few years after Signature released Bright Angels and Familiars, Jean and Levina Fielding Anderson put together a collection of essays about Mormon literature, Tending the Garden. In his introduction to that book, Jean continues his discussion of home literature and seems to side with thinkers and critics who believe the more directly literature teaches, the less delightful and persuasive it becomes. In contrast, a vivid and honest story, interesting and complex characters, powerful images, and affecting rhythms and sounds can often move the reader into new dimensions of moral understanding and religious experience." Jean also quotes President Spencer Kimball's 1977 appeal for literature and art that would tell the story of the restoration, the reestablishment of the kingdom of God on earth, the struggles and frustrations, the apostasies and inner revolutions and counter revolutions of those first decades. This doesn't sound as though President Kimball wanted a sanitized um, portrayal of Mormon history. This, um, 
And Jean focuses on the struggles and frustrations, apostasies and inner revolutions and counter revolutions, suggesting that these are often worthwhile subjects of valid Mormon literature. The definition of Mormon fiction isn't as straightforward as it might seem. Perhaps having one or more of the following characteristics would qualify. Stories treating Mormon history, stories in which the characters are or were Mormons with a wide range of beliefs and unbeliefs. Stories treating struggles common to Mormons. Stories authored, uh, authored by Mormons. Uh, stories in which the, the characters or the situations express a Mormon worldview. Does the orthodoxy of the author matter? Jean wrote, I believe authors' beliefs inevitably affecting the nature and quality of their writing also make a great deal of difference to readers, to what we are able to get out of his stories. And the stories he favors are written by people with a recognizably Mormon background, which leads them through their stories to express, reveal, develop, and challenge the shape of Mormon beliefs. Note the word challenge, not just express, reveal, and develop the shape of Mormon beliefs, but in some cases to challenge it. Jean wanted to provide a forum in which the writers of vivid and honest Mormon fiction could encourage and inspire the next generation of Mormon writers. Dialogue, he hoped, would be one such forum. Yet not until the second issue of the second year did Dialogue editors Jean and Wes Johnson introduce a short story. That story was Marilyn McMean Miller Brown's The Happiness Bird, a cryptic tale of a rural family's complicated feelings of guilt, anger, blame, and hope. A son and daughter are tending the sheep, and a snake bites the daughter. The son doesn't know the treatment for snake bite, and his sister loses an arm and retreats to her bed, silent. Although the story concludes happily, it is too complex, too enigmatic to be home literature. The next issue of Dialogue included a story about a 27-year-old dietitian in a convalescent home, a desolate single woman who has a robust fantasy life, but an anemic real life. The princess of the pumpkin lacks the certainty of home literature, but seems to me unsubstantial and dated. I am allowed to say this because I wrote it. The characters in those two stories could be Mormons, but they could also be Lutherans or lapsed Baptists. Back in the 1960s, both Marilyn and I were thrilled to have our stories in print. We were grateful for dialogue as a place that would publish stories by unknown Mormon writers, even if it didn't then publish very many. We revered mentors like Jean and Mary Bradford who encouraged our literary efforts. Two years later, Volume four, number three, was devoted to Mormonism and literature. There were articles about Vardis Fisher and Virginia Sorensen, that was written by Mary Bradford. Um, Bob Reese discussed aesthetics and religion. Sam Taylor gave advice to would-be Mormon fiction writers in a delightful essay called Little Did She Realize. A section titled Fiction and Poetry featured 10 poems and one story. Doug Thayer's powerful The red Tail Hawk, which again does not mention Mormonism. The 15-year-old protagonist is changed physically and mentally and presumably spiritually by a disastrous hunting adventure in a place that could be Utah or any place where cottonwoods grow. It wasn't Gene's fault that the stories he first published didn't make specific reference to Mormonism. Many Mormon writers desirous of being part of the real world of contemporary fiction, avoided those specifics. I know that was often the case for me. But the issue following the Mormonism and literature issue did feature a story, The Heart of My Father by Thomas Askland, that was filled with Mormon characters and references. And the next issue included another Doug Thayer hunting story, this one starring a return missionary. The first entry in Bright Angels and Familiars is Virginia Sorensen's Where Nothing is Long Ago, a fascinating account of a Mormon town's reaction to a killing over water rights. Published in 1953 in The New Yorker, the story challenges Wallace Stegner's assertion that Mormon fiction is a hard sell to a mainstream audience, 
because Mormonism's peculiarities take so much explaining. Jean incidentally considered this story a personal essay and said so in a 1988 symposium honoring Virginia Sorensen, uh, which she attended. Jean dedicated bright angels and familiars to Virginia Sorensen and Maureen Whipple, nationally recognized Mormon fiction writers in the mid 20th century. They taught us how, he wrote simply. Jean wasn't the first to anthologize Mormon stories of the, first, of the last half of the 20th century. Nine years before, Levi Peterson had published Greening Wheat, 15 Mormon short stories. Levi introduced the stories by themes of tension, tension between the commandments and an intractable human nature, tension between believing or not believing, tension caused by the failure of the promises. Jean arranged the stories in his anthology so that reader, the reader might see the influence of Mormon writers on other Mormon writers. In these very Mormon stories, he says, writers reveal their fundamental values and beliefs, their integrity and compassion or meanness and blindness, as well as their way of seeing the world. In, in all deci the decisions, small and large, that go into form and content, and finally make the novel or story or essay believable and moving. These stories are revelations of a kind, giving a vision of life filtered and energized through a believing moral intelligence, as well as a gifted and disciplined artistic sensibility. The title of the collection may echo, echo the first of Levi Peterson's themes. In Jean's words, the best Mormon fiction concerns both bright angels of spiritual reality and the familiar beautiful world in which we live and create our being. Jean's anthologies has led to other anthologies, notably Angela Hallstrom's Dispensation, Latter-day Fiction in 2010. Angela, an accomplished fiction writer, dedicated her collection to Jean and in her preface says that bright angels and familiars expanded my understanding and opened up possibilities that hadn't existed before I read these stories about my own people. The title of Jean's short story collection epitomizes Jean for the many of us who thrived on his backing and his blessing. He was, is, our bright angel, one who helped us navigate the familiar beautiful world in which we live and write. Thank you so much. Next, we'll have Christine talk about essay. So with apologies to those of you who've already read it, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I recently wrote a book with a chapter handily titled Essay as Form and Method about Jean's essays. And I'm just going to read a little bit from that. Eugene England championed Mormon literature, particularly the personal essay throughout his career. In the personal essay, he found a form in which he could integrate literary, spiritual, and political ideas. He also believed that personal essays, journals, and sermons were the forms in which the richness of lived Mormonism could be represented in its full earnestness and sincerity without being cloying. England himself rarely wrote formal or heavily theorized literary criticism. Even his writing directed to academic and secular audiences is focused on the ethical and personal themes of the literature he studied. Although England did not make it explicit, his own essays and his appreciation of the form suggest that the essay form, which allows unfettered curiosity and experimentation, explores contradictions without urgency to resolve them, and situates the author within her creation, provides an ideal correspondence with England's understanding of Mormon theology, in which God is imminent in creation and human beings are meant to try and fail and grow toward godhood in a universe that holds opposing forces and ideas in tension to create the conditions in which godlike knowledge can be acquired. His own published essay collections, Dialogues with Myself, Why the Church is as True as the Gospel, Making Peace, and the Quality of Mercy, aimed to, quote, show something of the range of subject matter and approach possible in the personal essay, to give a personal vision version of the intellectual and cultural history of Mormonism, and of course, to bear witness to the conditions of his own growth of mind and spirit. In a 1982 essay titled simply Enduring, England describes his search for safe places, 
even within the mountain ringed safe valley in which his family's farm was situated. His description is idyllic, a pian to an almost mythic agrarian childhood. Even there though, he felt the stirrings of existential terror and nausea. He writes, one evening there began to come moments when I could feel moving into my mind like a physical presence, the conviction that all was quite absurd. It made no sense at all that anything should exist. Something like nausea, but deeper and frightening, would grow in my stomach and chest, but also at the core of my spirit, progressing like vertigo, until in desperation I must jump up or talk suddenly of trivial things to break the spell and regain balance. Later, he would recognize a kindred fear in the writings of existentialist philosophers. The essay briefly mentions Paul Tillich, and his description of that existential nausea may have been influenced by passages like these from The Courage to Be, where Tillich writes, anxiety is the state in which a being is aware of its possible non-being. Anxiety is finitude, experienced as one's own finitude. The pain of despair is that a being is aware of itself as unable to affirm itself because of the power of non-being. Consequently, it wants to surrender this awareness and its presupposition. It wants to get rid of itself and it cannot. England describes his own fear as having unique contours shaped by his Mormonism. As in Tillich's description, it is the inability to escape the self-consciousness of being that pressed in on him. And since Mormon doctrine holds that human beings have always existed as intelligences, co-eternal with God, England wrote, there finally is no answer to the question of why and how I exist in my essential being. I just always have, and that is where my mind balks in horror. It's a different sort of fear than the existential anxiety inflected by a more traditional Christianity, which might question why God had bothered to make human beings at all. The essay goes on in meandering essaying fashion to describe the situations that awaken that dread ministering to a mother of twins, one healthy and one with severe and inexplicable disabilities, studying the many varieties of chromosomal disorders that create babies who inevitably live short and painful lives, witnessing his mother-in-law's decline and death from pancreatic cancer, trying in a way he knew to be inadequate to alleviate suffering. He would like, he says, quote, to take refuge in the mystery that an absolute God made it all out of nothing and will make sense of it or send it back to nothing but he has denied even that solace by his conviction that the God Joseph Smith revealed will not intervene in a universe created to expand the scope of human freedom to act, a universe that requires opposition in all things. The ending of this essay is rhetorically and philosophically unsatisfying. England draws no conclusions, but returns to the quotidian, his work as bishop, the mission of his small humanitarian aid organization, his life with his family, his middle daughter's recoveries from surgery, and his eldest daughter's new love. The piece ends as it began with a quotation from King Lear, men must endure their going hence as they're coming hither, ripeness is all. England's conclusion is that doing something is better than doing nothing, that integrity requires human beings not to give in to the appalling luxury of cynicism. The moral choice is to try, which is of course the French word from which essay comes, even in the face of the profoundest doubt. That trying for England meant plunging in to action, to writing, to speaking, to teaching. It meant tolerating ambiguity and messiness, even resisting closure and completeness. The personal essay appealed to England as a literary mode that allowed the expression of an integrated Mormon life, theologically informed reflection, moral action, faithful introspection, and aesthetic striving. The essay's form allows almost requires um, the integrated and usually first person voice of the narrator. It allows the author's effort to be visible to the reader and openly actively invites the reader's participation. It allows doubt and indecision and imperfection in its creative progression. It is not difficult to draw the parallels to the most optimistic strains of Mormon theology in a literary form that lays bare the stuff of human agency and choice. England finds warrant for privileging the essay in the Mormon theological emphasis on life as a stage where the individual self is both tested and created, and our history of close self-examination in journals and testimony bearing. For England, the essay is the form that can most fully represent the varied activities of the mind, vigorous thinking, but also believing and hoping and striving. Um, let's see. 
Uh, England not only highlighted the potential of personal essays to reflect and illuminate Mormon life, he actively championed the writing and publishing of essays. From the beginning, the journal England helped to create dialogue, devoted a sizable portion of its pages to the personal essay. England also encouraged the publication of essays in Exponent 2, a newspaper founded by Mormon feminists in 1974, and Sunstone, a magazine that also published its first issue in 1974 as a forum for Mormon and experience scholarship issues and art. By 1982, both personal and critical essays were flourishing in Mormon publications, and England co-edited a volume called Tending the Garden, which Karen just talked about. Um, in her chapter focused on the personal essay, Mary Bradford, who was one of England's successors as editor of Dialogue, was able to cite dozens of her favorite essays to highlight the features of the form as it was evolving in the hands of Mormon writers. Besides creating venues for publishing essays, England encouraged students and friends to write essays and submit them for publication. His student, Gideon Burton, um, who we'll hear from in a little while, uh, recalled, after I mused about the ideal kinds of writing and writers I thought our LDS community needed, Gene commented both casually and sincerely that maybe I could fill that need. As he did for so many, Gene made me feel that I had something to say, and his own writings gave me a model for how to say it. Anyone with ties to Mormonism who wrote in a personal or literary way would find himself or herself gently woven into Gene's narrative of an evolving and improving LDS literary tradition. England's championing of the personal essay appears to have been prescient. He could not have predicted the explosion of personal writing that the internet would enable, but he was right to identify the testimony bearing impulse that is instilled in Mormons from the time they are assigned to give their first talk in primary at age three as the germ of self-conscious storytelling from personal experience that grows into the autobiographical forms of literary reflections, reflection that he identified as the locus of Mormon's best potential contributions. The proliferation beginning a few years after his death of Mormon blogs with their thousands upon thousands of little essays would probably have both delighted and worried him. Delighted because the spirited in every sense of the word discussion of Mormon topics was exactly the kind of dialogue he craved. Worried because despite his ceaseless encouragement of liberality of expression, he was also somewhat conservative with regard, with regard to form the lack of editing and free for all nature of online publishing would have brought in England's enthusiasm for plunging in and doing something into conflict with his dedication to careful writing and, and rewriting. His own essays went through many drafts and were frequently revised, sometimes over decades. Um, I, I wanna just end with a really good question that Bruce Jorgensen asked me the other night about um, Gene and essays, and maybe we can talk about this. Uh, he, he pointed out that the essay in its classic definition from Montaigne and forward um, is uncertain, that, un that uncertainty and exploration is sort of a precondition of writing essays. And to therefore um, say that the essay form uh, is, is related to testimony bearing, which we usually think of as the expression of certainty, um, introduces a, an interesting tension into how we think about essays. So I'm gonna just leave that on the table and um, we can come back to it if we want to later on. Thanks. Thank you for sharing and for priming the pump on our coming Q&A. Uh, we'll hear next from Calvin Burke. Alrighty. Thank you guys so much for organizing this conference and for letting me be here. I definitely, I definitely, I, I, I have a big sense of, I, I feel like, I guess, like to quote Elder Holland, Jeffrey R. Holland, I feel a bit like the mule at the Kentucky Derby today. I feel out of place, but I sure like the company that it lets me keep. Anyways, so my, my paper is entitled Great Expectations, Eugene England and the Body of the Mormon Intellectual. In the early 1980s, the dust was barely beginning to settle in the life of Eugene England, following two international denunciations of his theological work by legendary apostle Bruce R. McConkie. In the middle of this war with McConkie, eyes all around waited to see how England, a symbol of liberalism within Mormonism, would respond. Many scholars in Mormon history, subjected to public and private intellectual disagreements and denunciations, had left BYU and Mormonism. Before instance, 
Even George Pace, the conservative CES scholar denounced a few years later by McConkie at about half the force that he threw at Gene, resigned as a stake president, pulled his books and spent his nights and weeks praying for forgiveness atop the mountains east of Provo, signaling by flashlight nightly to his family that he was still alive. But what of Gene? What did Gene do? In, his first, in Gene's first remarks delivered in Denver, almost immediately following his second denunciation in October 1980 General Conference, and in the interregnum before Elder McConkie's infamous letter of rebuke, Gene spoke upon the topic of tragedy, where he argued that it was an essential evidence of the assurity that one was following one's godly mission. Entitled Joseph Smith and the Tragic Quest, Gene quoted the prophet of the restoration himself. And this was his response. I know what I say. I understand my mission and business. God Almighty is my shield. And what can man do if God is my friend? I shall not be sacrificed until my time comes. Then I shall be offered freely. Gene concluded his remarks on Mormon tragedy this way. Mormon theology revealed through Joseph Smith claims that the universe is essentially as well as existentially paradoxical and therefore is irreducibly tragic. Thus Mormon tragedy will not be tragic because of the failure of religion, but because of the success of religion. Mormon tragedy will reveal not only that false concepts of God and the universe fail man in his confrontation with reality and leave him desolate until he constructs new and better concepts, but it will also reveal the tragedy that comes for a human being as it did for Joseph, because he has found the true God, become his prophet and fulfilled his mission with fidelity. As St. Paul knew, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Let it never be said that George Eugene England Jr. was naive. He knew what he was doing, and he knew what it would entail, at least in part. Gene did not leave the church, of course, following his disagreement with McConkie. Instead, he, you know, part of his response was to write an essay originally called Why the Church is Truer Than the Gospel, which later would become one of his most famous works. To invoke Linda Silito, they threw him from the tower and he spread his wings and flew. Yet unlike many of the other, of the other folks who'd find themselves due to various disagreements with leadership, Gene did not distance himself. Gene flew not away, but flew back to the tower to continue Linda Silito's imagery. And he did it almost laughing as if he had missed the entire storm at all. He was like Peter Pan. Within a few years, Gene became both a bishop and a full professor at BYU. His work had only just begun. Gene's greatest love after Charlotte, the children and the saints was Shakespeare. He loved the theater. To understand Gene, one must understand that he saw his work, as he stated in a 1966 address to the University of Utah Institute about dialogue, as one about construction. Gene was well aware throughout his life that the space for a kind of Mormon such as him did not exist or was at best fast dwindling. Gene did not despair of this. However, Gene's work instead was dedicated toward constructing such a space. He did not merely use his words to wish for a better Mormonism or flee to the far-flung waste paces of Zion in the mission field, the slightest sign of turmoil. Instead, Gene went and he worked very hard at positioning himself, his body at the center of the Mormon universe, ground zero, a place where you could measure the tension between authority and intellect with a Geiger counter, Brigham Young University. Gene ran full-flung into Nineveh as if his presence alone could save it from destruction. And there in the particle accelerator of Mormon trauma, the cradle of the future leaders of Zion, Gene say to claim, there he built something. He built it with his hands and he built it by existing and continuing to exist in a place where people told him a Mormon like him could not dwell. And crucially, even there he advocated for others who did not belong either. In the heart of Zion, Gene preached repentance. Should God not spare Nineveh? Should God not spare BYU? In 1993, in a dramatically different address, now also nigh mythical Mormon apostle Boyd K. Packer described what he termed three major, major invasions into the body of the Mormon membership, major invasions which he claimed were causing the saints to be caught up and led away. These were not chemical dependency or adult rate or even infant mortality or childhood obesity. These instead were what Packer perceived these, the three forces threatening the life of the body of the church were the feminist movement, the gay and lesbian movement, and the ever-present threat of the so-called scholars and intellectuals. Crucially, these three things are not abstract concepts. They are categories of people. They are kinds of bodies. Notice to Packer's precise wording about what these groups had been accomplishing, major inroads. But what do these things have to do with each other? And how can a kind of body be a threat? 
at least within the minds of 20th century Mormon leaders, each of these embodied movements, these categories of individuals constituted uniquely hazardous embodied performances. It is easy to understand women and gender and sexual minorities as distinctly threatening forms of embodied performance to a Mormonism uneasily ensconced within conservative belonging. Some theorists have gone so far as to delineate the ways that whiteness, queerness, feminism, and disability rights each pose unique yet intertwined threats to global capitalistic hegemony, a hegemony for which Mormons had by late 20th century sold the greater stock of their birthright for. It is perhaps less easy to understand, however, how a category like the so-called scholars and intellectuals wound up being included alongside the feminists and the queers. Yet the history of Mormon studies itself, when examined from a biopolitical lens, demonstrates that Mormon scholarship since J. Reuben Clark's educational sexual innovations in the 1930s has been intimately intertwined with the struggles for liberation of the bodies of marginalized Latter-day Saints. We cannot tell a complete story of Mormon intellectualism or indeed Mormon history at all if we are not honest or attentive to the ways that the concept of doing Mormon history has functioned as a form of protest, subversion, transformation, and even liberation of the marginalized bodies of the Mormon people. In other words, history teaches us that to be a Mormon scholar and to do Mormon history and Mormon studies as a Mormon of necessity involves a kind of prophetic performance. Because of Mormonism's fraught relationship with this radical past, a radical past that it once hallows and defiles, rejects and embraces, entombs and reenacts, to be a Mormon scholar inherently challenges and troubles the defined contours of the Mormon body politic. We are in the business of resurrecting bodies, the bodies of our deceased ancestors who lived and behaved in the world in dramatically different ways than our church now teaches us is the right and correct and proper way to behave. Mormon theology, when it exists, is extraordinarily crude, yet at its heart, it is a commitment to a radical materialism, to what Jared Hickman called a profoundly monistic cosmos, one where the sacred and the profane are collapsed together. Mormonism can be understood as teaching a cosmos of a God bound to laws, laws which God, God self cannot change. And that revelation on both God and the universe stems from both study and faith of these unchanging laws. Study and faith therefore can be understood as the two distinct branches of revelation. To be a prophet doesn't just mean having a seat in the red chairs. To be a prophet can also mean having a PhD. Though the jury is out on whether there ever was a Mormon intellectual golden age, modern Mormonism displays a commitment not necessarily to historical fidelity so much as a particular form of biopolitical polity that accords with the lights of American secular belonging. Mormonism is sought desperately to bury the bodies of its past adherents that don't accord with those lights. The sex deviants, the feminist advocates, its anti-capitalistic economics, its race traders. The early Mormons critiqued and defied a nation built on genocide and racial sexual capitalistic exploitation. They were an existential threat to American empire. If, as Coviello, Peter Coviello tells it, the story of 19th century Mormonism is the story of the radiant Mormon body, of how the Mormon, radiant Mormon body was enchained by American empire, then the story of 20th century Mormonism is, is the story of that radiant body, of how that radiant body remained in chains. This brings us back to Eugene England and his life. It is apt he is now considered the founder of Mormon studies, for though he is neither the most radical nor the most interesting scholar of Mormonism, and certainly not the most marginalized, his life, his body, and his body of work demonstrates not a concern with perfect history, but a concern with the ways that history acts in the here and the now. Gene did not simply do historical work or literary work. Gene used Mormon literature and Mormon history not merely to advocate for, but to create, to build into existence forms of Mormonism that did not yet exist. His commitment to dialogue meant that he never lost sight of the humanity of leaders who, oft, who at times lost sight of the humanity of those that they jettisoned and the past they continually sought to bury. Gene's work was not about history. His was about resurrection. Born of goodly parents and profound wealth and privilege, Gene, like Moses, resisted the siren calls of belonging. His prophetic work was not to be found in hallowed halls of privilege, but among the bodies of those who did not belong. Like every straight white cisgender man, he dwelt you know, in those, in those locations profoundly imperfectly and made many mistakes. But unlike many, nearly every other straight white cisgender man, Gene apologized frequently, profusely, and often. Even more, he applied what he learned and he changed. And he sought to teach others how to change. Gene's primary parable for teaching the atonement was Shakespeare's King Lear. Gene understood that being like Jesus meant standing as Cordelia before those we love and being cast out even when we bring them to rem a remembrance and an, or an understanding of their awful situation. And Gene also knew that like Cordelia, discipleship often means wandering the wilderness, finding in the, again those in power who have blinded themselves and forgiving them and returning alongside them to live and to die with them. The most curious thing about Gene's life is that he spent it not just preaching repentance, but building repentance by consistently seeking to remain in relationship with Mormon leaders, even as he publicly contradicted or disagreed or built Mormonisms that didn't align necessarily with their vision. Gene was making, nevertheless making possible the conditions for institutional repentance and reconciliation. Gene's passing from cancer was untimely and devastating to be sure, and yet Gene passed while working vigorously toward whole relation to humanity in a way that most privileged straight white, especially Mormon men, never have the chance to encounter. 
Jean's work, imperfectly and often obnoxiously, nevertheless was a pro project building a Mormonism fit for all bodies, including our normative ones. The danger Jean and others like him in Mormon scholarship at the time posed was his work made possible, if not inevitable, a, a kind of Mormonism where all bodies could belong. If heaven is constituted by relationships, Jean passed on far greater terms and far ahead of the game than many of his contemporaries. There is a kind of victory here, a victory that surpasses tragedy. As Jean said, to be a Mormon scholar means speaking the truth in love. This can bring sacrifices, but also it brings beautiful adventures. Let it never be said that the life of Eugene England was a tragedy. What is the greater tragedy? To have been given much and sold it all? Or to have been given much and to have built something better? Let each of us remember the words of Elder Maxwell. It is the, it is the disciples, after all, who have all the best adventures. All right, thank you to Kelvin and to all our panelists. Uh, we have a few more people we invited to attend to come respond to associated with Gene in different ways or engaged with his work. Uh, we have Gideon Burton, Travis Manning, David Sigor, and Clifton Jolly here. Um, so we wanted to invite any of them who would like to respond at this point. To, to give general thoughts and responses, and then we'll go ahead and take questions from those of you who are watching the live stream. Uh, please go ahead and type those in to the chat and we'll move them over. So Travis, David, Gideon, Clifton, any of you have initial thoughts you'd like to share? My life was forbidden to speak, and so I will. Uh, so this raises a question to me, and it's one that Bob and I have discussed. With Jean, or Clifton, you're not coming through very loud, at least where I am. So if you can up the uh, volume, that would be great. I would assume that I understand my technology, which I don't. Maybe if I get nearer the microphone, is that better? Yeah, that helps a little. Thank you. Hold on just a second. The problem is I've got a new microphone. And, um, uh, now, it's not going to let me, so I'll speak up. Uh, one of the questions that I have, and, it, and I, I've realized just over the last a few weeks that I really don't understand the difference between Mormon conservatives and Mormon liberals. He is frequently called a liberal and he didn't like being called a liberal as I recall. He may have changed over time, but uh, I remember uh, we discussed it specifically and he considered himself a conservative theologian and um, and Certainly, by any stretch of the imagination, he had a, cons a conservative lifestyle. Uh, I understand why academics and intellectuals want him to be a liberal, because uh, by and large, this group considers itself to be liberal and considers liberality to be the proper course of action, since the brethren concerning consider themselves to be conservative. And so I'm, I'm wondering by what standard now do you constrict him uh, to liberality? I, mean, I think I understand what a liberal is generally. I'm a liberal, and I know what a conservative is. Bob is a conservative. That doesn't keep us from having lunch together, but it, it, it does create a rather uh, interesting interstices between us as it, it, it was me and Jean. And so what I'm interested in is for those of you who have identified him as being liberal, what is your basis for that identification? Yeah, do we have any responses from the panelists or, or the other uh, live guests? How useful is it to, to use those liberal and conservative labels? And is there anything in that political reception history that's that's worth highlighting? Um, 
Well, since I just read a whole book called Eugene England, a Mormon liberal, I feel like maybe this question is directed towards me. Um, the whole book is, is answering that question of, of what it might mean because uh, you know, as Gene often said, he was both conservative and liberal in, in many ways, and he thought those should be neutral descriptors, um, not names for, uh, not ways of dismissing and totalizing people into camps. But um, he, he used the words liberal and conservative um, frequently in ways that don't map neatly onto um, any other American usages of those terms. So um, politically, he's not, um, you know, liberal in the way that we would have understood that in the 70s and 80s, certainly, and 90s. He's definitely not progressive in, in the ways that we use that term now. Um, theologically, he's, he's liberal in the sense of being open to the most expansive and um, optimistic parts of Mormon theology and to the Roberts and Widso legacy rather than the J. Reuben Clark, you know, Joseph F. Smith, um, Bruce R. McConkie strain that gets, that I think we can call conservative, except that Gene's strain is older. So is he the conservative um, who's, who's actually conserving an older Mormon tradition? Um, I think in the end he that it's the the optimism and and openness to modernity that I that I um, identify in him as liberal sort of the embrace of the world rather than the um, conservative religious apocalyptic retreat from the world um, and and I think that counts as liberal but. Um, I, I certainly hope that the term is is complicated in my usage and in, in the rest of my book because you're right that it doesn't it's not tidy and um, he would have resisted it. I actually wasn't thinking of your question, although I plan to focus on you tomorrow night. Uh, the, uh, I was thinking of Calvin's mention of it. Speak closer to the microphone, would you, Clifton? Maybe, maybe then, uh, Calvin, are you able to respond to that question as well? Clif Clifton wondered how you'd interpret that. Yeah, I mean, like I, so I like everything Christine said is perfect. I mean, her whole book is like Mwah, chef's kiss, the olive leaf plucked from the tree of paradise. But like, like I loved like literally like in Christine's introduction in the chapter where she's talking about this, about this, she talks about how Jean uses the words like conservative and liberal very imprecisely. Like I think more than anyone else, Jean like really, and like <sighs> he, I think he deliberately tried to deconstruct and to muddy the water around what conservative and liberal meant or deconstruct those meanings in order to make space for people like him who were part of the new left and, uh, you know, emerging out of this, this crate, the cradle of radicalism in San Francisco, but elsewhere in, in America as well. He, he, I think he, his deconstruction of those terms was a way to make space for more people to belong. I, I see it as a very important like tactical thing. I mean, what English major doesn't know how like murking up like linguistics is also like a project that makes greater room or is a liberatory project. Like, I mean, it's funny to me to read so much of his stuff like oh, I am a, you know, like his his amazing essay on, you know, why why some Utah Mormons should become Democrats. You know, he begins like I am a conservative and then proceeds for like 12 pages to talk about why everybody should become Democrats. Like a whole bunch of people should do that. Or like he so he, he always plays up like his conservative fortes, like as a way to like almost like pull a fast one later on. I feel like, or to open up new possibilities later, maybe pulling a fast one's not like the good thing. I think it, it's kind of funny, but I, it, it's always about like expanding, pushing forward, opening. And that's why I think Christine's title for her book is also incredible. And it's also perfect too, because like, I mean, in the age of neoliberal, you know, the collapse of neoliberalism that we live in, like Jean suffers from a lot of the same blind spots that have kind of contributed to some problems here. So it's not to say that Jean was perfect because he absolutely is not, but, he, he was this continuing, this willingness to use almost intellect as a way to negotiate new spaces. We've also got a comment from William Morris in the YouTube chat. Um, 
pointing people toward Eugene England's essay, Danger on the Left, Danger on the Right, that's about um, aesthetics, right? And, and how these assumptions uh, around different sort of political camps uh, have, have shaped our literature uh, in the late 20th century. Um, I wondered if we could make sure to get back to, to the question Christine had thrown out earlier. Um, Eugene England talked about the personal essay as an extension of testimony bearing and this Latter-day Saint genre of, of sharing personal experience. And then Bruce Jorgensen had asked, how does the traditional of personal essay interact with the, the testimony bearing tradition of, of certainty and conviction? Uh, anyone, I, our panelists or our additional guests have, have thoughts about that question? Yeah. I'd, like, I'd like to try to answer that if I could. Um, I, I also have a kind of follow-up question to that. Uh, I, I think that it's, it's not a very difficult question to answer. I think it has to do with um, a kind of earnest way of uh, bearing testimony digs into the, the uh, simultaneously the certainties and the uncertainties that one has. It's sort of a, a tool for burrowing into the, the self and in a kind of public way that helps to extract some hopefully some authenticity about that. Um, and, and I think um, very much in the tradition of, of the liberal arts as, as well, that uh, um, we are able to refine our uncertainties. And, and that itself is a kind of act of faith and an answer at the same time. Uh, Gene uh, taught a lot of us how to better frame our questions. And then that ends up sort of what, enhancing our testimonies of fill in the blank. Um, but I, I'd also like to kind of extend that uh, question. We know that Gene was such a such a contributor to this to the personal essay. He wasn't alone, of course. There were others um, that were mentioned that have uh, really contributed to the essay form. Uh, but, but I'm curious about why why has he seemed to signal the essay as the the, the sort of the er genre of Mormon expression, even while he as a good literary critic, he could call attention and often did to great fiction and theater and um, and poetry, but, you know, Bob, you looked at his, his very scant poetry. Um, uh, Christine, you looked at his, his essays very closely. Um, wh what is it, was, was it a certain, um, something in the cultural atmosphere that required the personal essay as a mode? Because I, I think um, he, he was saying so often that our theology, um, provided a, a means of amplifying all the arts and, and indeed all the literary genres by extension. So what, why was, was it just a personal preference or what is it about the personal essay and Gene? Um, I have some ideas, but I actually think that it would be fun to sidle up to that by asking Karen why it wasn't um, short stories. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, can, I can't help but think that the kinds of things that would make short stories not good, you can do in, in personal essays. You can, mm -hmm. you, you can make points. <laughs> you can be didactic. I mean, it could still be offensive, but it, it, it would make for terrible fiction, but you could do those things in, in personal essays. I thought it was so interesting that he thought that Virginia Sorensen's short story was a, really a personal essay. He wanted to believe that, I think, uh, um, because it, 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 it had a, a wonderful moral. Um, it, it wasn't too obvious. It was still a beautiful short story, but that's, it's harder to do that. It's much harder to do that, I think. Uh, I, would, I would be interested in Travis's uh, comments. Travis, I've just read Travis's beautiful essay on Gene as an essayist, and Travis, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Pressure, can you guys hear me? Honestly, I wrote it 20 years ago, and I haven't. Uh, I teach high school English and speech, and so my, my career has. I wrote the essay in grad school um, at a place um, that didn't really appreciate that essay. Uh, and the essay that I wrote was called I Write Personal Essays to Save My Soul uh, The Sermonic Roots of Eugene England's Literary Voice. 
um, and it's in the 2004 AML proceedings. Um, and honestly, my career it sort of diverged. I haven't really analyzed um, much from the essay form, but I had originally been attracted to Gene um, back in the mid '90s. Actually, I took the Ian's class. I went first, second year out of grad school. Um, hopefully, his classes are still as tough as they as they were, you know, 25 years ago. But years ago, wow. Um, but he introduced me to Eugene England, and I heard him speak a few times and um, didn't know him well personally, but read all of his essays. So in grad school, was able to write about him um, from, from the distance, really. So to your question, I don't have a good answer to that. I'm so sorry. I, let me just say that I think that one reason Gene is attracted to the personal essay is that in a personal essay, you can use poetry, you can use, use fiction, you can use scripture, you can weave your own construction using elements that fit different genre. And I think there's something uh, inviting about that. And when one does it as well as Jean did, uh, very powerful. So I don't know, but that's just my sense that he, he saw that as, uh, as someone who loved fiction, who wrote poetry, who loved drama, uh, who certainly was very home in script, with scripture. They could weave all of those together in a way that gave his, uh, his particular voice the kind of power that it had. I want to just float an idea quickly related to this question. And that is, as Jean was both looking forward and trying to establish a contemporary body of literature and looking back and trying to establish a sense of a literary past, um, he was really interested in journals as a form and, and in non-traditional literary forms. I, I think maybe because there was the biggest possibility there, right? Like we didn't have a, a great Mormon 19th century novel, but it was possible to imagine or argue for a particularly vivid life writing. And certainly, certainly he made those arguments. And I wonder if there was some interaction between his preference for essay as a nonfiction genre and his desire to connect back higher generations and, and value Latter-day Saint life writing from like the pioneer era. Yeah, well, I think just the, just Travis's title is helpful, right? The word sermonic. Um, if, if you're looking for a body of Latter-day Saint literature, you know, what we do have are sermons and not just by trained preachers, right? Like we have, and, and so that means it's both, both the biggest corpus that we have that we could mine and um, it's the most accessible, like, you know, lots of Mormons do basically know how to do it. Um, and, and, uh, and Karen's right on, right, that the, the didacticism of a sermon is, is what would kill a short story and can definitely kill personal essays, but um, it, it's less of a liability and you can learn to tone it down a little bit while still maintaining essentially the form of um, you know something that that is familiar and, and known to, to many Latter-day Saints. I had a conversation with Jane. I think I found my microphone. Am I too loud now? You're great. Good. Um, and it's, uh, it's because he tried to conscript me to the idea that the personal essay is not merely associated with Mormonism, but that it is the Mormon aesthetic form. And it provides a kind of direction uh, uh, and access to inspiration and those things that, that should, be, uh, should be important to conservative Mormons. And, and, and the fact is that he was very certain in terms of the tension between aesthetics on the one hand and content on the other, that in Mormonism, we uh, always had an obligation initially to content. Uh, and um, uh, by the way, he stopped trying to persuade me to write personal essays after I wrote Selling the Chevrolet, which he hated. And so 
uh, but he and so he was uh, he was powered, I think, by a, a, a very deep sense of commitment to what his father and he believed his mission was to be. And that mission could not be as immediately or directly addressed by uh, fiction, uh, poetry, or other aesthetic efforts. And so I think he really sought to elevate the personal essay to accomplish, uh, he, he saw one of the highest achievements of that in the Journal of Mary Goble Pay, which is on the one hand artless, and on the other hand, uh, deeply moving and insightful. And so I, I think that was part of his commitment, but Jean was nothing if not changeable. And so who knows after we discussed it. Interesting. I wanted to, to try quickly giving you guys an exercise. If you had just a moment to report on one thing about Mormon literature over the past two decades to Gene, uh, what particular development would, would you want him to know about? Or, or what would you want to communicate about how the field has developed uh, in the years since his, his death? <laughs> I think I would want him to read lots of Mormon mommy blogs from the early, um, the mid 2000, you know, 2010s. Like I, th I think um, it would be good in, in um, many ways uh, because his feminism was still developing as he um, got older and also because he um, did appreciate women writing about the details of their lives. And I, I think he would have been delighted by many of those. I think that's de definitely true. Uh, in, in his Mormon lit class, he, he assigned us to read uh, Mormon Women Speak. And that was my very first experience of recognizing just um, the range of uh, female experience in the church. And, and, and I think he would very much be interested in that. I, I would like to know, Gene, if you're around, if you could tell us about um, your thoughts on Mormon film and where that's gone. And it's kind of... Mm -hmm been zigging and zagging in different ways. And the media landscape, of course, is evolving. I'd specifically love to uh, sit him down and see what he thinks of some of the podcasts that are out there. It's such a, a range of them and uh, some of them very earnest, some of them, um, well, they're all over the place, but um, there's some genuine efforts to, um, I don't know, democratize some of the aesthetics and belief that he had uh, articulated so well within some of these new media. So that's what I like. I, he didn't just end R-rated movies, <laughs> ever. I, I, guess, I guess that I particularly would be interested in as the conversations that so many of us had with Gene as politics and um, the world of technology uh, were expanding and exploding in some ways that what, how we would feel about um, Facebook and TikTok and uh, all of these other things that have so kind of complicated narrative uh, and complicated the world, the moral world in which we live, uh, which he was uh, keenly interested in. My guess is that Gene would be, um, you know, the, 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 the timing of 9-11 and Gene's passing uh, is, um, uh, you know, highlights for me the tragedy of his premature uh, death, that we don't have his voice within a church that is uh, responding so much to the world and what's going on. Uh, so however his voice would be heard in essay, in poetry, uh, in op-eds, however, I would love to hear it. I miss it immensely. But David, we haven't heard from you. Thanks, Bob. Um, I've just been enjoying this conversation. I'm grateful to be part of it. I, I'm probably the least among uh, those here that knows uh, Eugene England and his work. I, I learned about it from Christine and then uh, from other other books, Terrell's book too, and recently. So I guess I would just say a couple of things. First of all, I would love uh, to hear Eugene's take on kind of 
the, the philosophical and theological developments of Mormonism, uh, the writings of Adam Miller and Jim Faulkner and some other thinkers who have created a kind of space in what I think kind of came to be known as Mormon studies, uh, but is really that space, I suppose, between uh, literature on the one hand and uh, politics on the other hand is kind of the, the theological and political discussions around that kind of thing. I mean, going back to some of the earlier discussions, if I might for just a minute, I, I think we, we, we are torn by two contradictory injunctions in the modern world, as Bruno Latour notes. And one is the, the desire to move towards progress. And the other is the desire to move backwards towards old certainties. And that's what we mean by liberal and conservative. And we're, we're torn up by it in a way, uh, both individually and collectively. But often uh, this decision between uh, progress and the old certainties is not a real one. It's, it's a fabricated uh, disjunction that we have sort of in our culture that is not serving us well. It comes really from the French Revolution and we should get rid of it. <laughs> we need to find new ways to think and to move forward. And I think that gives me just a chance to comment briefly on Christine's question about uncertainty. When she said that about testimonies and uncertainty, I'll take another stab at that, which is that uh, I think about the testimonies that I bore as a, as a child when I was five or six and stood in front of a congregation uh, saying what was undoubtedly uh, filled with great uncertainty. And I think we have this tension in, in, in language. I, I mean, I felt it very purely and innocently uh, but at the same time, I, I had hardly an inkling of what it was that I was talking about. And I think so to sort of take a stab at how that relates to the essay, you know, the standard language or vocabulary of, of, of our testimony meetings is probably more certain than the actual mind is. While at the same time, the language that we use often to bear testimony is also incredibly inadequate to the feelings that we might have and the desires that we might want to share with others uh, through our faith. And I think uh, probably that goes back to a, a, a misconception that we have generally in, in the modern world between what we mean by certainty and what we mean by uncertainty. Uh, and I, I guess I'll just leave that there, but I think, I think uncertainty is a very precious thing. It's something that we find in essays, but it's also something that we find in testimonies. And, and we, shouldn't, we shouldn't have to apologize for that uncertainty. It's actually the source of, of uh, well, I, I guess the, the art that I'm really interested in studying, it's the source of rhetoric, which is, uh, as uh, has been noted by Umberto Eco, is the art of saying, well, what may or may not be true. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we have that, and it's, uh, rhetoric is also a practiced imperfection and the worst fear of idealized reason as, as Farrell teaches us. So what, what I mean by that is that we, we, we do live in a space where this, that, that Christine talked about, that Bob talked about, that Karen talked about, where uncertainty is, is in tension with certainty. And our, our, everything about our experience in life is, is strung along that line of tension between opposites. And uh, that's where I think Eugene lived, and it's where I want to live. Thank you. If I could just uh, kind of go back to what uh, Christine was saying uh, about maybe Gene reading blogs uh, and um, social media. And um, uh, it seems to me that his daughter, Jody, has kind of perfected the form of somehow combining sermons with um, some of these these other forms, and I think he would be very pleased uh, with that. Good point. Yeah, I completely agree. Jody's Facebook page is definitely one to check out. I, I might uh, like to, to uh, ask a kind of related question to what James asked us. How would Gene address any of the salient issues of our day, uh, you know, or, or how would he address uh, uh, students or or marginalized groups within the church. Uh, it seems like um, it, there's there's a plenty that could be said, and I just wonder what he would say. I think that whatever he would say would be thoughtful. Uh, Gene did think deeply, and he was always interested in conversation 
with, uh, with anyone who was interested in talking about important ideas or issues. I, I think that the, um, the tension that exists in the Latter-day Saint world between the real and the ideal, between an institutional church and that other thing we call uh, the gospel, uh, I, I would really want to know uh, if uh, he would still write uh, the church is as true as the gospel, or if he might want to say the gospel and the church are true in different ways. Uh, that would, uh, that is where we are in the church today is there's a much more diversity, a more much multiplicity. The international church is growing in its prominence and its power within the church, yet the church still continues to struggle, as I think all churches do, with central moral issues. And those were at the heart of Gene's Christianity. They were at the heart of his Mormonism. They were at the heart of his humanity. And so uh, I think in many ways he would be excited by the possibilities. Yeah, and I think maybe to say, to say that another way is to say that uh, Eugene, Eugene, if he were alive today, I think would continue uh, to express his belief in the presence of a common world. And I don't think that's a, a liberal idea. I don't think it's a conservative idea. And I don't, I, I wanna believe that uh, it's an idea that we should all share as human beings. Uh, it's bigger than, it's bigger in many ways than Mormonism, the idea of the presence of a common world. And he would, he would continue to reinforce that, his commitment to that, as we should do, I think. I think Jane would be excited by what might be characterized as a less rigid, a less uh, uh, arch conservative uh, uh, social political world. I think he he loved having conversations with everyone, including general authorities, and I think he would find the many more open uh, possibilities in the modern church uh, and the contemporary church than perhaps uh, he found in his own time. The thing I love about Dean is that he was so talkative, like just unrelenting in his, and I think in his commitment to do or to engage with the world or to engage with Mormonism in the way that he did, like just, it, there's just, there's such just a profound optimism there like I mean the thing for me that was like reading his like you know flipping back and forth between his interactions with some of the general authorities when I was first in the archives like my first day there I was like holy cow like there'd be like a terrifying letter from Boyd K Packer and he'd just write back the sunniest reply and then immediately get like this beautiful letter from Gordon B Hinckley that would be just totally opposite of what President Packer had sent him like within like three weeks from each other but I think there's there's like almost like this like his his willingness to engage and to never lose sight of the humanity of any of the people involved in a discussion is something that I found extraordinarily inspiring for me. And so I feel like Gene's, and I think like while Gene, I think positions himself and a lot of his work as like a, a peacekeeper or trying to be, or try to like at least stylistically figure as like, I am the center between two opposing sides helping reconciliation. It's very clear, I think that his, his willingness to, I think, put the the power that he has in motion, almost always like, it's very clear that the way that he faces is almost as, as an advocate more toward institutions that might have lost their bearings or lost their way. I think, and like, if I if I were to have questions for Gene, I mean, I I I, I think he'd love Twitter. I think he'd love social media. I think he'd be amazing at both of them. Like, <laughs> probably the best octogenarian like on Twitter, I feel like. And I think he would, I, I, I wish every day that he were still here. Like the thing for me that's so interesting, and this is the, the thing too, like I, I can't tell you how many people that I've sent some of his, his talks to, his essays, especially on like controversial issues, like during, during of course, like the George Floyd protests, like I was sending genes are all alike unto God to people. And it was wild to see like so many Latter-day Saints, especially my age, like felt like this like like almost reverential respect for some of the stuff that Gene was willing to do. And I think part of that comes that like Gene never saw anyone as beyond the reach of the atonement. And I don't just mean like in terms of people can repent, but that people should be willing to repent, like to proper repentance. 
And I think that might be like the like a dangerous part of Gene's thing. Maybe that maybe the most dangerous thing that he undertook in his essays or in his in his writings was that he was willing to say, no, our leaders get it wrong. And by doing that, like I, I was talking to my one friend about it. It's like I feel like one of the reasons that Gene's works have aged so much better, even than like <laughs> general conference talks given like three or four years ago, is because Gene was willing to go the last quarter mile. He was willing to walk with people that way and to do so publicly in a way that is was extremely rare, I think, especially for for someone at BYU. But I think it, I think I, I'd like to think that he'd be still be doing those same things. Um, and I, I guess like and to return back to I guess David's question a little earlier, I like I would be really excited to see how Gene would interact with post secular theory. I feel like like Christine's book is beautiful. She talks about this quite a bit there. And like the Gene's like essays almost anticipate like a post secular scholarship where people's individual spiritual experiences are treated as ontological verities and like realities, things that are independently real. And that to say that someone's like spiritual experiences are non-existent or not real is a form of, you know, is, it's a form of colonial imperialism. Like, so I, I'd be very interested to see that how Gene would interact with those things, because some of his work, like, I mean, my favorite essay by him is called On Finding Truth in God. And it, it almost anticipates the post-secular turn in literary theory. I, yeah, I wanna... You'd have to leave out the jargon because he... Like he's kind of allergic to jargony theory. Like he maybe, but also like his stuff is like it it's still it's not easy reading either. But yeah, you're you're right. <laughs> hey, I, I'd like to insert a little compliment here to to Calvin on on what you you said many things in, in your opening segment there, but one thing that really stood out to me was that Gene helped to make possible um, institutional repentance. Did I did I get you right? And I think that I've just had a new realization tonight. I mean, we, we, we do think of Gene more in the liberal camp, but he was deeply conservative with respect to um, holding to the church and its, its structure, not its orthodoxies necessarily. And he challenged so many um, parts of it, but uh, his, his deference to authority was, was almost painful to observe, right? As he was not being treated well, and yet he um, did something that, I don't know, Jesus would do. And one of the things that I, I felt like one of the most profound lessons I got from Gene, and I, I live by, I try to live by all the time, is that he would assume best intentions, especially when there's evidence to the contrary. And he would act towards people as though they were acting in good faith. And that wasn't always responded to well, but sometimes it was, and it made all the difference. Um, I remember Levi Peterson saying that, and maybe it was at Gene's funeral or something, but he, how it made such a difference uh, to him personally that the Gene thought so much of his of his intentions, and um, I think Gene played that role toward the church. Um, he was often put in an awkward position, you know, uh, persecuted within his own word by conservatives there, and and he would have that enormous amount of patience and that optimism that's been mentioned to try to um, stick with the institution imperfect as it was and apply the atonement. Yeah, Gideon, thank you so much for, for that comment too, actually, because it that's some, one thing that like I came across, this is just like my own personal journey in the archives, like working through everything, all of Gene's papers, like holy cow, it was the, easily like the most transformative, one of the most transformative, if not the most transformative experience of my life was like touching nearly every single paper that this man touched. But like, like I came to like, like the, like the, to my like horror, but also like my redemption, like I came to see a lot of the same things that, that Gene saw, like, or understood, like in terms of his relationship with the, the church, like I, like, and I mean, this is, probably a hot take for Twitter, but it's like, I, we need each other. We need each other. Institutions need each other. Like, I mean, we, we need institutions and we need to remember that people within institutions can be good. And I think I love what you said there too, like that, like, I feel like to me, it's like, I, I, I could see Gene just seemed to give people over and over again, the chance to be amazing over and over again. Like, and 
like it's like you said there's there's so many times I think especially like in classrooms or with with students like people would would rise to that occasion I think sometimes they didn't I wish we remembered Jean more for the times that people did rise to that occasion than when they didn't like I feel like if his life hadn't you know been cut short by cancer I feel like I mean I would love to see what he would have done more at UVU I, I would love to see what he would have done at Mormon studies. To me, there's something I think almost poetic in the fact that like he spent almost his entire time at BYU fighting with Richard Bushman, trying to get Richard Bushman to come back to BYU. And after Gene passes, who comes back to found the first real Mormon studies chair, you know, out of his, his exile and, you know, sending, you know, you know, ceases sending epistles and comes back and founds this kind of the first Mormon. So it's almost in some ways like finishing a little bit what Gene started. And so I, I, I don't know. I think there's there's something beautiful about I think those 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 two giants helping each other in that way. Anyway, it's been our hope at uh, Graduate Theological Union to eventually be able to have an endowed chair in Jean's name. That hasn't happened yet, but uh, I hope that uh, someday it might. He certainly deserves uh, such an honor given his great uh, contributions to the wide spectrum of Mormon letters and Mormon thought. Well, I wanna thank everybody for participating on the panel. This has been a wonderful discussion. To close us out, I, I think we've got time uh, for each of you to just give a title of, of one essay or poem or a piece of fiction, either of Jean's or that he touched that you would encourage writers and literary critics today to, to revisit and remain in conversation with? Enduring. Is the, Bob, you remember this probably, there is the poem called Fargiver. It was published in a very early dialogue and I always just love that poem. I just think it expresses so beautifully the complexity of belief and life. <laughs> there was a letter I think that he wrote to Dialogue uh, early on in which he talked about home teaching at St. Olaf's and essentially having to travel a hundred mile circuit while I was home teaching. And he said that home teaching over a hundred miles, these spread out congregation, is enough work that it keeps you from worrying too much over the questions you would otherwise be worrying over about the church. And I think he was very much defined by that kind of practical religion. My vote would be for the essay, uh, No Cause, No Cause, which is a quote from King Lear. And read King Lear while you're at it. And then see what Gene said about it. That's my vote. I'm going to channel William and say danger on the left, danger on the right. Um, there are too many favorites, but that's a great one. Mm. Christine literally just described mine, but like I, uh, my favorite one by him, I mean, my, my, I, I told you my, my other one earlier on, but my, my favorite one by him is Finding Myself in the 60s, which hasn't been published ever before. And I hope that maybe Dialogue or somebody can, can get on publishing that because it was, I think, especially reading it in context of 2000, you know, 2020, 2021, everything going on now, Gene's story of his of his conversion experience and his experience with the, the civil rights movement in the 60s is everything to me. So I, in terms of coming to, term, coming to terms with the idea that everyone in the church is right about almost, is wrong about almost everything, but right about the most important. And that his counterparts on the left, like the, the radicals were right about almost everything, but wrong about the most important. I really, I love that anyways. I'll say the weeping God of Mormonism. You could have two. There's also Monte Cristo. We could go on. <laughs>
<laughs> John, John Benyon in the chat uh, recommends Easter Weekend. Um, another great essay. Uh, Travis, did you want to throw a title out? I, I don't, but thank you. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much. It was a pleasure to be here. We hope you'll join us uh, tomorrow evening where we'll have a panel on the Association for Mormon Letters list of 100 significant uh, Mormon literary works and, and how they went about uh, creating that list. And we'll unveil the list tomorrow night. Uh, thank you very much for spending this evening together.